Good afternoon. Uh, we're a smaller group, which is great, so hopefully it will be even more interactive. Um, we, this is the fifth workshop that we are uh, covering. Uh, we will be, um, we'll be covering a theme which has nothing to do with finance, nothing to do with investment readiness. It would have to do with um, how do you align people to strategy. Basically, how do you go about ensuring that, the, um, uh, that your strategy is well implemented? Um, so this is the topic that we're going to do today. So what I will do is I'll share with you two things. On the first part, we'll cover uh, what is strategy. So we'll go very quickly because a number of you have been exposed. But the second part, which is the most important part, is what you as leaders or founders of your company needs to do in order to ensure that all your team and all your stakeholders are behind you in terms of the strategy. Because if not, this is one of the failures that you have in strategy is that you don't have the alignment between the people and between the strategy. So I'll share with you a model. This is a model that has been, it's fairly easy to understand and we will run through a couple of examples of what, uh, uh, how can this model work. So this, by the way, has been, um, I've done it as part of the uh, AUB has asked me about a year ago to run it. So I run it to the leadership team of Soclean. Uh, this is before they had all these problems. So I'm not the one causing the problem, but this is, so I'll use the same slide as I used when I was at, uh, at AUB to, um, uh, to, so we had the entire uh, Soclean leadership team um, behind it. And then we run through this. Uh, this was a two day workshop. So what we're doing here in uh, two hours and a half is what has been covered over two days. So I'm going to go uh, quickly on some of the topics that might not be as relevant to you, but you will have the entire slide set for you to go back. And if you have questions on it, feel free to come back to me. So by the way, for those of you, most of you know the place, you've been here a few times. For those of you who are new, this is Speed. Speed is an accelerator. So what you do, Hala and all the others, all have their own companies here. So you have about 10 companies. These companies are funded by, um, they're funded by Speed, so they will come, they will get $30,000 in exchange for 10% of the equity, and during three months they will encourage the companies to develop, they will help them put together their uh, business plan, and at the end, which was about a week ago, these companies present uh, in front of uh, uh, audience of investors, they present what, uh, what their company is all about, and then they ask for money to be raised. So the second step for them is to get additional capital, and with this capital to help transform their organization. So Speed is run by the team who is high behind the door. You have, uh, and they've been very kind enough to allocate the space for us. Now, um, the day before yesterday, we did it at the UK Tech Hub. Uh, we had uh, a pretty amazing turnout of uh, close to about 60 people uh, that, uh, that came in. And this was on basically the journey that you need as a startup to prepare yourself to get outside capital into your company. So what are the different phases behind it and how do you need to prepare yourself? So here what we'll do, so this is, uh, um, I'll go quickly uh, on this. So what we're going to do is we, we um, the first question is, um, is, is going to be more about strategy. So I will share with you uh, the uh, definition of strategy and I will share with you some of the templates. Now some of you have been exposed to the templates. So this is a series of templates that will help you in terms of trying to represent and illustrate the strategy to whoever are the stakeholders, your employee uh, or your investors or others. So we'll share with you these different templates and then we'll move to the second part, which is basically what, are, what is the model that we want to, uh, to use in order to be able to ensure that we have alignment of the people to the strategy. So what is strategy? The strategy, normally a good strategy answer, I'm trying to keep it simple, five basic questions, is why are we changing? So what are you trying to do? Why are you doing, why are you implementing this new strategy? This is the first question that you as founders need to understand and explain to your people. The second question is where are we going? So why are we changing, where are we going? Where are we heading in terms of, uh, uh, how are we going to get there? So the third question is about what is the process to get to where we are, to where we want to be? The fourth question, and this you need to clarify to each member of your team, is what is my role in this journey? So I'm here, what should I do what is my, in order to be able to help you achieve the ultimate results? And the fifth one is how does success smell? So what are we trying to achieve from a, a success point of view and how do I benefit as an employee or as a stakeholder into this journey? So these are five questions 
that you as founders need to clarify to your stakeholders, to your employees, uh, to your partners in terms of deciding. So this is a bit of a definition of what strategy is. Now if you look at the dictionary, you have the definition. It starts the art of science of the planning and conducting of a war, generalship. This comes from strategia. It's a Greek word, the function of generalship, a particular long-term plan for success. So it comes from a Greek word. It means basically aligning your military resources in order to be able to win the war. Then you have the academic definition. Strategy is the direction and scope of an organization over the long term. So it shows over which achieve an advantage in a changing environment through the configuration of resources, competencies, with the aim of fulfilling stakeholder expectations. So this is taken from Michael Porter that they have. So what is you have is a direction, scope, over the long term, so typically three to five years or longer, which achieve an advantage in a changing environment uh, through the configuration of, so basically how do you allocate your resources, how do you allocate your competencies in order to meet your stakeholders' expectation. And who could be stakeholders? So who are typically stakeholders in a company? Customers, Customers shareholders, who else? Employees. Employees, so these are stakeholders. Suppliers, so these are all stakeholders that you have. The strategic definition, an integrated plan that places your company at a relative advantage, ideally sustainable over competitors. So this means what? That you, salut, Rafi, si tu veux te mettre de la place ici ou à côté devant, hein? Ça c'est au Raja Ma'ahedhon. Ça c'est au Raja Ma'ahedhon. Ça c'est au Raja So this is, this goes what? Is what is your competitive differentiator? and how can you sustain this competitive differentiator over a period of time. So this is the answer that you, why should I go to, uh, to Rafi to buy his uh, service, medical service, if I could get it from others, and how can I ensure that Rafi uh, is able to sustain this competitive differentiation. Now I came up with my own uh, definition. I believe it's a process that needs to create value. And typically, this process, you don't do it alone. So when Rima is going to run and do her uh, uh, strategic plan, she needs to do it as part of a team. So this is value, cre which consists of scanning the market environment. So the first thing we ask Rima to do is tell me, how big is the market? Who are the competitors in this market? How much is this market going to grow? So the first thing I'm asking her to do is scan the market environment. Look at market trends, look at customers, look at competitors, tell me who they are. Who are you going, who is going to buy from you? Where are you going to distribute your product? Is it ABC, ABC? is it others that you have? So this is the first step, is look, then identify breakthrough opportunities. Whenever I'm going to sit down with her, I say, what are the four or five things that you need to do in order to ensure that you're going to be successful? And she's going to list it. Today I had the opportunity to come and sit down with two companies. One is a company that was here six months ago, Rida that you know from um, Pixel, and the other companies that we had is a company that is cardio diagnostic, who went through a first phase of funding and now getting into a second phase of funding, and we did exactly this with them. For three hours each, we sat down and we identified the breakthrough opportunities. And align people, process, organization structure, performance metrics, and leadership behavior and culture to build a sustainable competitive advantage in addressing real customer needs. It's a big mouthful. So what it says is first start by your market. What is your market? What is happening to your market? The more you know your market, the more you know your customers, the better you are at defining what your strategy is going to be. When you've done this, tell me what are the breakthrough opportunities that you're going to focus. What are the things that you must do in order to be able to do it? Once you have these, align your people, your process, your organization structure, and I'll show you this is the second part, is we'll show you how we're going to do this to make the alignment. If you have done this, and this is creating a competitive differentiation, you have a strong strategy in place. Any questions on this? No question? Is this clear? Okay, so now what we do, um, okay, I'm going to, now why, probably I won't show you this one, why do you think strategy fails? Why would strategy fail? It's not well implemented. Okay, one is it's not well implemented. Yes, second. Okay, it's not clear enough. So the strategy is not clear enough. Well implemented, yes. Not adapted to changing circumstances. Okay, so it's not flexible. It's too rigid. So it's not one. So you have, you need to make sure that this strategy is in some ways either scalable or adaptable. So it's people. So you don't have the right resources. It could be people. What sort of other resources you need to implement? 
It could be technical infrastructure. It could be money. So it could be money, it could be systems, it could be people. You don't have the resources to do it. Why are the reasons why strategy fail? You don't have the direction. Okay, so part of it is the strategy itself could be flawed or could be not be very clear. We don't know where we're going. So the strategy could have a problem itself. The execution is lacking because of either people, money, or systems, or technology. What are the reasons? You don't Okay, so you could be poor understanding of the market, poor understanding if you're customers. All these elements could help affecting the quality of your strategy. Yes? Uh, the team are not behind you. So they're not behind you. So, this is, so it's not only a question of having the right resources, it's in ensuring that they are behind you, ensuring that they understand where you're going, ensuring that they're here to support you. If you're all by yourself, you realize that you're missing them, you lost your, uh, your key. What are the reasons? Okay, so part of it, we mentioned the dimension of long-term versus short-term. So you need short-term, you need to know what you're going to do in three, six months, and a lot of the time I spend with the company that I coach is I force them to decide what is critical for the next six to 12 months, and then we focus on this. But at the same time, you need to have a view of where you're going in the long-term. So it's not only about short, you need to have a clear idea about what is the short-term, but you also need to know what is the long-term. Other reasons why I fail. Okay, so part of it is that you have done a strategy, but you need to make sure that you have the checks and balances. Make sure that you are sitting down and reviewing. Are you on track? Are you off track? Are you, why, if you're off track, why are you off track? And a number of strategies, you don't have this review mechanism that is there to help you. So this is quite important. Other reasons why we fail? This is essential, but you have to believe in it. If uh, you don't, like you... Yeah, That's of course. Why. Of course, you need, I mean, the strategy needs to, needs, I mean, it needs to come from your guts. It needs to come from your heart. It's something that you truly believe in, because if not, it will show. If you, as the owner of the strategy, do not believe in it, it's not going to work. Other reasons? You have important reasons you've missed. Why would strategy fail? I mean, follow what you mentioned. Uh, integration between the team is communication, empowerment, uh, to make sure clarity. Other reasons why strategy fails? Uh, metrics could be good. What are the metrics behind? So what are the metrics that we do and we're reviewing these metrics. So this is what cannot be measured, cannot be, what cannot be measured, cannot be managed properly. So make sure that you have clear measurement so that you have implementation. Other reasons why strategy fail? I'm sorry? Or you could have accidents. You could have what? You could have some major factors that is coming in here that could disrupt. These accidents could be disruptive. Technology. It could be disruptive in terms of politics. It could be destructive in terms of, you don't know, it could be a civil war in Lebanon. It could be a new technology that comes and breaks completely what you have to offer. So these are regions that you have. The other reason that are still missing is you need to make sure, I give you the example. I worked for HP for 20 years. HP acquired Compaq. HP had a culture of um, we share, we discuss, we make sure everybody is aligned. When everybody is aligned, we implement. Compact is we shoot first, we ask questions later. They're coming from Texas, we're coming from California. It was completely different structure. You look at Daimler Chrysler and you look uh, at the integration between German, very German, very engineers. Uh, Chrysler was based in uh, Detroit. Complete. So if the culture is not aligned with your strategy, the culture would eat your strategy at lunch. It means that you will never be able to survive if the culture is not supporting your strategy. The culture of your company. The culture of your company. So if you come up and you're trying to do, uh, and the integrating company is one of the companies that I'll be also coaching, he's just making a merger of two companies in Constantin. These are completely different culture. One culture is very much corporate, the other one is extremely entrepreneurial. How can I come and make sure that these are two Lebanese companies existing, these are companies that have been operating for three, four years. The integration of the culture is critical, even before we talk about the strategy and the strategic plan. Uh, uh, Reis is his name, Reis Raf, he came and said, Constantin, the first thing I want is I want us to align in terms of the culture of these two companies, make sure that we have it, and then we could focus on the strategy and ensure that the culture is supporting the strategy. So the cultural aspect is going to, you will see it, is something that is very critical in all new strategy that you try to implement. Okay, so these are great answers, by the way, that you've done. So this is, I'm sorry, yes? Uh, uh, culture is different from governance. Governance is, I mean, culture is more the soul of the company. Uh, and you could have companies with completely different culture. How do you ensure that the two cultures merge? 
because I gave you the example of HP and Compaq, but I'm giving you the example of these two companies, and he will tell me one is very much corporate, very structured, the other one is completely entrepreneurial, you know, there is no policy, no procedures, nothing, people would go, and where the other one has all functional policy and procedure, and I need to merge the two into one company. So if these, and from this would emerge one culture, which would probably going to be a mix of the two, and trying to take the best out of the two. The governance is important, the governance is ensuring that you have the right structure afterwards to follow that your strategy strategy is really not only integrated in the culture, but is really followed out in an approach which is, which is more systematic. So this is the governance of, uh, and this is part of the governance of the company, the boards, the relationship that they have. Now, uh, so this is um, lack of rigor. So this is uh, what you've done. The poor market research has been done. Uh, reliance on intuition. Belief that the constraints and obstacles are too big, so we don't, so I, I tend to give up. Uh, perfectionism, you're trying to aim for perfection, forget it. Aim for a certain uh, element, go for it, uh, learn and adapt. The strategy itself could be flawed, unforeseen, uh, fundamental unforeseen mark or unforeseen events. Uh, failure and ability to align people with strategy. This is critical. This one is probably one of the most important one. Failure and ability to align the culture. The culture is also quite important. Failure to exhibit leadership in a strategy execution. So if you have decided to go a certain way and the people in your team are acting in a different way, you don't have the right leadership supporting what you're trying to do as a leader of this organization. So it's very important that the leaders are behind you. Poor, incomplete or uncommitted implementation, this is the execution that you have mentioned. Failure to create performance measures, I'm sorry, failure to, co to create performance measures, the KPIs that has been indicated, feedback loop, this is what Samar has indicated, the feedback loop, monitor and adjust, this is quite critical, failure to communicate internal and external, so you have this, these are major reasons why strategy fail. Now why it's important, because if Michel wants to implement a new strategy, these are the sort of checklist that he needs to make sure in order to ensure that this, there is quite uh, an alignment so as to reduce the risk of derailing the strategy. Okay, any questions on this? So you basically have answered most of it, it is here as a reference. Now this is a number of, you have, you know, dozens of tools and templates that you could use to define a strategy. Now you have different phases. You have one phase which is basically an internal assessment where you look at yourself, you look at your company internally. A second phase is you look external. Each one of them is a template it's a, it's a, that you could use or a, a framework that you could use. Then you look at creating the strategic intent. Intent is basically the vision, the mission, the values that you have. Then you test it and then you basically go and you execute. So what you have here, bonjour Marguerite, so you have, what you have here is you have, so we will go through all these lists. So you have seats over here. You have, marhaba Joanna. Fik ta'adi haddi azabidik Joanna. Rajah timli be Joanna. Okay, so you're uh, a, bright, a bright lady with a bright future ahead of her. Okay, we spent three hours with Joanna this morning. So she was, uh, and her uh, founder. So this is, by the way, one of the companies that we have ad uh, ad and that identified what are the breakthrough opportunities that we're going to have over the next 6 to 12 months. So it was a very interactive session that we had with her and uh, with Ziad. And out of this, a roadmap came. And out of this roadmap, then we're going to zoom in and start implementing a number of these uh, elements. Okay, so these are templates. I'm going to go through the list. Now, there are part of them that you are familiar with. Some of you are familiar, others are not familiar. I will go and I will describe each one of them briefly so as not to waste the time of those that you know. And on some of others, if you don't know and you want to have more information, I'll be more than happy to sit down with you. The, one, the first one is the internal, external, basically it's the SWOT. The SWOT means what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses internally in the organization. As you, as individuals, you have the same. What is your personal SWOT? So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And then externally, what are the opportunities and what are the threats? Or look at it uh, yourself. What are the opportunities for growth that you could have as an individual? What are the threats that you have for the growth that you face? So it could be personal or it could be for the company that you aim. So this is the SWOT analysis. S for strengths, W for weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So strengths and weaknesses are internal to the organization, opportunities and threats are external. And this exercise, we do it as a team, marhaba Ziad. So we do it as a team, with the entire team, so we have a good view. And this is a great start for a strategy. 
Because any strategy, normally what you want to do is you want to develop your strengths, you want to look at the weaknesses and see how you could address them, you want to maximize the opportunities and you have to understand the threats and what they could have on your business. The second one is on the market trends analysis. The first thing I'm going to ask you, even if you don't know the size of the market, is what is happening to your market? What are the two or three things that are happening in the market? So what are, and you need to clarify them, you need to put them on paper, and this is quite important. You could get it from the internet, or you could get it from customers, or you could get it from your own contact, but you need to have some sort of indication of what's happening to the market. The third one is the, what Michael Porter has developed this, it's called the five forces. This is the, the, and these forces defines how attractive is the market. And I will cover this and I will share with you what are these forces. So this is another strategic tool developed by uh, Porter from the Harvard Business School. And this is a very simple way of being able to access whether Ziad is, I mean, he is in the business of monitoring. He has a cloud-based heart monitoring system that he has. Is he in the right market? Is this market an attractive market, yes or no? And how do we know whether it's attractive or not? And I will share with you a model to define this. The other one is your core competency and value chain, an exercise that I run with Michelle and with the team. So we put the value chain of B-Synchro. We look for each of the steps of the value chain. We look at, okay, where do you excel? So he starts with research, then there is product development, then there is, uh, refresh my mind, uh, after product development, you have the sales of it, then you have the support of it, and I missed someone in between. Design. What is it? Uh, design, implementation. We had implementation. So this was on the project side, we had implementation. Then what we did from this, we decide, okay, where are you excellent at and where are you average at? So the value chain helped us in terms of being able to assess the organization along each of the elements behind it. And then as foundation, we had HR, we had IT, we had finance, we had legal, we had uh, strategy, which were foundation block. And we would assess the company based on their core competency. So what, this is the value chain. What are the areas where you are excelling and what are the areas where you have progress to do? And based on this, we then design the organization, the new organization that the company is going to have. So we started, and this is a process that we started and we implemented and, uh, and we have. So this is another uh, tool that you use. Another tool is looking at life cycle. The same way that you going through all your cycle from uh, uh, childhood to adulthood to, uh, to old age, civilization go through the same thing, products go through the same thing, and companies go through the same thing. And your strategy, depending where you are on your life cycle, would be very different. If you're in a growth mode or a mature mode or a decline mode, you will have different strategies depending where you're positioned on this cycle. And we'll share with you this. The portfolio analysis, this is BCG. BCG is the Boston Consulting Group. This is a company that uh, initiated the business portfolio. They would look at a portfolio of different products and then they will decide which are the products that are critical to invest and which we want to divest. Now this has been taken by GE and GE perfected it. So GE had this and then they came up with the portfolio model and I will share with you this portfolio model. So all these are tools, uh, scenario planning. When you're going to present your scenario, when the, I'm going to use another example because uh, uh, Purima would, uh, would have, but let's say that you have uh, a company that needs to present the, uh, they present their forecast and then on their forecast you could have a, a worst case scenario and a best case scenario and based on this we will have difference uh, so the scenario planning is quite important and the risk management template is basically what are the key risks that you're facing and how you're going to address them so this is another template customer needs mapping is what are your customer needs what is critical for them what is less critical for them and how happy are they with the services that you're providing very happy not happy and you get a matrix this matrix is critical because it would show you in the, your customer's eye what is critical and how well you're doing. You might be doing extremely well in areas that the customer doesn't even care. Or you might be doing very poorly in areas which are high. Understanding your rating from the customer on areas that are either not important or important is quite, yes. But the contact with the customer is not direct, it's through a platform or a mobile app. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what you typically want to do is you want to reach out at these customers. 
Well, you could you could call, but it's not you who do it. Normally you need to do because if you do it, in some ways you're biased, so you're conflicting. So let's say another resource, a student or somebody, you give him the questionnaire, ten questions. I could give you example of these. They would ask the question. They will tell what is important, less important, and most importantly, they will tell you how happy they are with your service or unhappy they are with the service. So this is how. So you have to reach out to them through a third party that is neutral, and this should be. Uh, and then you take the inputs and act on it. So, but this is quite important. The competitive positioning. I always ask today, for instance, one of the output that Juna, Joanna has said, uh, I've asked her to do, is fine. Cadu Danazic is great. I want to know who are your competitors in the US? Who are your competitors in the MENA region? I want to know how you differentiate versus these competitors. And I want you to tell me how you're going to maintain this differentiation in the years to come. So this is one of the output that she has to work on, which is basically using the competitive positioning and defining how sustainable is that USP means unique selling proposition. What makes them unique is today a certain number of features. The fact that they're cloud-based, they are unique. Nobody is now cloud-based. The fact that they are global in terms of their reach, a lot of them are regional or country-specific. But in three years down the road and five years down the road, everybody would be cloud-based. And in three years and five years down the road, a number of other companies that are competing with them will also be geographically dispersed. So I want to know not only how they differentiate now, but I want to know how they're going to differentiate in three or five years down the road. So this is another one. Uh, the organization diagnostic is when you look at your organization structure and identify whether you have gaps. And these gaps could be either function that you have not seen that you need to fill. We went through the exercise with, uh, with B-Synchro. Or you could have function that are filled today but need to have a different skill set to be able to do them. And then you need to change. This is important because it involves changing people. And so for organizations that have been here for a long time, but it's an important exercise to do when you do your design to ensure that you have not only the right organization, but you have the right matching of resources to the organization. KPIs is the balanced scorecard, is what I've been discussing with you. And you see the theme is, re is, uh, is another one where you basically state and this is what we've done today with two companies, is you state your key performance indicators, but you also state your key strategic initiative, and you could do it for startups, and you could do it for existing companies, small, medium-sized companies, and this is also part of the review that you have. The others are MBO is management by objective, it's all the same. EFMQ is the European framework for quality management, the Hoshins, we were in HP for 20 years. We used Hoshin, which is a Japanese term, uh, and business fundamentals is basically the same. It's all the same sort of, uh, but basically state what your KPIs are, track your KPIs, and then competitive benchmarking model is, um, uh, is how do you, it's actually the same as the competitive positioning. Okay, so these are tools. I'm going to start with one. One is here, is on your competencies. To do your job, you need resources. And then you need competencies. A resource is basically something that is available for, I need people or I need money to be able to do it. The competencies is things that are going to differentiate you against the others. What are the things that are essential? So what are the things that you cannot outsource, that you have to insource? Uh, on it? So some of the areas you could outsource. For instance, when I talk to Michel, Michel said Constantin, I'm happy to outsource my finance. I gave him a hard time and pushing back. I think it's critical. You cannot outsource it. But in his mind, he can outsource finance. He can potentially outsource HR on it. So I'm asking him, what is resource? What are competencies? And then from these competencies, because he agrees that there are few. So if you ask him, implementation is critical. His research is critical. His pro product development is critical. He will never outsource those. He will do it in source. Then I will ask him, out of your competencies, which are the ones which are threshold versus core? Threshold means that they are aligned with the competitors. Core is these are things that differentiate you. And we answered. We went through the value chain. So this exercise, I encourage all of you to do it for your companies. So what are the resources that you need and what are the competencies? Resources is basically things that you could decide that you want to do by somebody else. And they're not important. Competencies is things that you really want to implement. And then the difference here, what is thresh threshold means aligned with the others. You're basically average. Nothing is making you special. The competitive is when you are activities that confer competitive advantage, difficult for competitors to initiate or obtain. This is the first step. And these are the areas that are going to make you unique. I encourage you to do this exercise. This is one template. I'm going to show you a number of templates. You will decide which one is adaptable for your organization. And the series of these templates will help put and what and shape your strategic plan when you move forward. Are we clear? 
So it's going to be a lot of templates, you're going to say constantly, it's the, it, but it's okay. These are the tools, and then you decide which tool you want to use when, and when is the most. So this is one which is quite important. Another one is what we have done with, uh, with Michel and the team. So we looked at the, uh, uh, from inbound logistics, this is a manufacturing operation. Operation, outbound logistics, marketing and sales services. Then we went into subsets, some processes, and then you define which one you're excellent at, which one you're not as good at. So you will have, this will be a help way. And then you have some other supporting human resource, technology, you could have finance, which is probably procurement here. You have company finance, which are here supporting. The percentages, forget them, that's much more the resources in this specific case that you need. The value chain is important. The value chain shows you what are, how do you move from an idea stage to a support stage, and where are you good, where are you very good, and where are you going to make a difference in terms of your organization. So the value chain is a second tool that you need to understand and you need to master. Even if you're software, or if you're manufacturing soaps, or you're pr uh, producing uh, healthcare medical uh, services, all of them you will have a value chain. What you do with your value chain, and then you plot. This is the value chain. Inbound logistics, operation, outbound, marketing and sales, and then you plot compared to your competitors. This gives you an idea how well are you compared to competitors A and competitors 2. So you know what are the areas you need to focus. So when I'm asking Joanna, she needs to go back to this and say, Constantin, on the value chain, this is where I believe we are strong. And this is where probably company A in the US and company B in Japan is much stronger on these areas. So this is another way, looking at your value chain, how do you differentiate versus your competitors? Now, who tells you this? Where do you get the feedback how good or how bad you are with compared to your competitors? Customers. Customers. Customers, who else would tell you? Your sales. Your, the, the sales force would tell you because they will come back to you. So who else would tell you? So customers would tell you? I mean, people who are exposed to the, but typically mostly it's customers because these customers are facing with other companies so they're in a better position. Uh, you have, and one way of getting it when you interview people from competition, they will tell you and they will give you some information that could be of help to you. Now another, so this is the same thing, is the, uh, uh, now another one you need to do is how do you position your product or your service. One is you can position it price-wise. So you could decide that you want to price yourself very low, so as to gain market share. It's a pricing decision. Or you could price yourself high. This is your decision to do it. So if I ask Rima, Rima will tell me, Constantine, this is quality product that I have. My pricing strategy is definitely going to be on the high side and I have plenty of rooms to justify why I'm going to charge a premium compared to other brands that are existing. Although she's new to the market, she wants to buy on the high side. The second dimension that we have to go is we have to look at the perceived benefits. This is quite important. Is how are these, so this is your brand. So this is, the stronger is your brand. Now in the case of uh, Rima, she is new. So the brand is not yet there. So her challenge will be, how do I go in a trying to build a strong band when there is a perception of high benefits from my customer where today they don't. So this is where she needs to do tests. This is where she's going to give samples for people to try. This is why she's going to have testimonials from companies or from individuals or from, I don't know, fashion act, you know, actors or actresses that we have. So this one here, so if you are pricing high and if you have high perceived, perceived, not what you think, is what the customer thinks. The perceived benefits, you are talking about a strategy which is called focus differentiation. If you are here with basic benefits and basic price, you're no frills. So no frills means what? Easy jet, typical example. Extremely successful, extremely profitable. On the other side of the thing, you could have um, Emirates Airlines or Qatar's Airways. You have these are high price, they have uh, uh, high value. You know that the screens, the seats, the waitress, the, the, um, uh, the service that comes in, the quality of the food is completely good. So you could make money here and you could make money here. Where you don't make money when you're in between. If you're sitting with your, in between the two, you have an issue because then it becomes a me too product at an average price. It's very difficult to differentiate. So this is one way of being able to, it's called the strategy clock. And then you could go around the clock in terms of Focus here, differentiation, and this basically when you have high price with little, this is, this is doomed for failure. Okay, so this is another way, it's trying to plot them. So it's either cost leadership, 
which is not the case of uh, uh, Rima. So it's not, she's not into cost leadership, but you have a number of companies doing very well. My father loves, he lives in Germany next to uh, Aldi. Aldi was the first uh, retailer in Germany and it was the equivalent of Walmart. It's amazing. I go to this, it's amazing how low the prices are. I don't know how they do it. But they do is they focus on a number of items, they do buy huge quantities of it, and they reflect a lot of the discounts that you go into the customers. But you get prices which are unbelievably low for wine bottles, very good water, so they, and their strategy is working well. So what do they do? Scale efficient, a big volume that they purchase. Um, okay, this is for uh, production, process innovation enhancement, this is in terms of cost, outsourcing, avoid marginal customers, and here they have cheap capital, process engineering skills, frequent focus reporting, tight cost controls, job function specialization. So these are all initiatives to support when you go to the uh, EasyJet, whoever is selling you the ticket is at the same time at the door to open and sometimes could also be the, way, the, the person in the plane to help you. So you have multitasking that is taking place. You have examples of how can I take cost out of the organization. Now on the other side, on differentiation, it's more on the brand, product quality, service quality new product development, strong focus on advertising. So the brand is important, the perception of the benefits is important, and here it's about marketing, creativity, it's about research capabilities, product engineering. So this is also another way. So you need to decide where are you? Are you on the cost leadership or are you on the product differentiation? So high quality, how brand? And I will show you a, a way to be able to structure your uh, program. Now this is another tool, this is what BCG invented, which is portfolio metrics. What BCG did, and this was a long time ago, it was in the 60s, and it was taken by GE. You look at, um, I use Dima, I could use another, she would have different types. She would have soap, she will get to, into other types of products. What I'm asking her to do is to be able to tell me on one axe is what is the market share. Is it low market share in this or is it high market share? On the other axe, are we little growth or are we high growth? For those where we have um, low market share, low market share and low growth, these basically are the dogs. So these are where you have very small portion in a market that is not growing. The question is why are you there? So BCG call these the dogs. Here, where you have low market share but you have high growth, it's up to you to decide this is a question mark. It's maybe you're, most of you are in here, we're in high growth, but you have low market share. How do I go and I move over here? So how do I go about increasing my market share? So this is another one. So this category is the question mark. Here are the companies that have, you have high growth and high market share. These are the stars. These are the companies in your portfolio or the services in your portfolio or the products in your portfolio that have high market share and high, uh, and in here you have high market share but low growth. These are cash cows. Typically the cash cow, if you look at them, on one side you have the revenue in grey, in other ones you have the relative cost. Typically when you're a cash cow, you have high revenue and you have low cost, you're milking the cow. So you're taking a lot of profit but it's not growing. You need the cash from the cow to do what? To help your question mark and move the question mark into stars. So it's important when you have your portfolio, it, of course you should not have dogs. Dogs are it's a mistake, you have to accept the mistake and move out. But here the question marks, what you might have question marks, you start with question marks, then you need to move into here. So what do you do in order to increase it? And once you increase it, uh, at one point in time, the growth is going to come down. So you always need this to come up with stars, and you need cash cow in order to be able to fund your stars and to fund your... Uh, so this is another way of looking at your different products and different services, it's your portfolio approach. The same thing would apply for Michel, the same thing would apply for, uh, for Ziad. When you look, you have different products, different services, how much margins are you generating, how much growth there is. All what this does is it looks at the growth, it looks at the growth that you have, and it looks at what sort of market share that you have. And based on this, then we look where do we want to get out, where we want to invest. So typically you want to invest in areas here that have the potential to move to stars. You want to make sure that your stars last for as long as possible. You make sure that your cash cow also, you could milk them and you need to get out of those. Now GE took it and GE said, I'm going to do it more sophisticated. Now it might be too sophisticated, but I think it's of interest for you because you could apply it. What GE said, it's fine. I'm going to look at the business trends and my competitive position. It's basically me. 
how am I in this market with my product, am I really competing and competing well and I have a differentiator that is clear and over here I want to look at the market. So this is not me, this is the market. Is the market an attractive market? Is the market a growing market? And based on this, you're either weak, average and strong. So here what it is, it's about your market share. You have good market share, technology strength. Do you have what it takes? If I go back to Ziad, prove to me that your platform is the best platform available. Uh, prove to me that it is the marketing skills. How good are you in building your brand? How, good, how well recognized it by your competitors and your customers? Do you have the right management? Are you profitable? Are you able to compete and sustain? All these things is to decide how is my competitive positioning. And you will position yourself either weak, average or strong. This is the market. The market is what is the growth, the size of the market, the growth rate, seasonality, profitability, all these things is on the market. And the combination of the two gives you different elements. So if you have strong business strengths and you have a great market, definitely you want to grow. If on the other side you have low market attractiveness and at the same time you are weak in terms of your competitive differentiation, then you need to exit. And GE will sit down and will look at each of the operating companies on a quarterly basis, decide where they're positioned, and if they're positioned over here, they're out. They sell them. They sell. It's gone. And the companies that are here are the companies that will get most of the investments. These companies will get average investment. These companies will get low investment and they go out. This is the BCG portfolio that is adapted to a company that you have. You say Constantin GE is a big one with startups, but even as startups you have different products. You know, when we were discussing this morning uh, with uh, Ziad, he has an existing product offering. He also is coming with uh, th two, potentially three other products and services offering that he needs to have. He will have to ask himself this question. Once he implemented, is this, does this make sense? Is this aligned to what we want to do? So this is another tool. So I'm showing you templates that you could decide to use. Uh, so this is what they do. They look at this. GE put it a little bit. They give, give a going factor. Then they rate it. And then you can up fund values. And based on these values, they decide whether we exit, we invest, or we divest on it. So these are uh, ideas. Another template is the life cycle. Now the life cycle in all products, when uh, uh, you start, you have to invest. So you invest in here, all this period you invest and you have very little revenue. So this curve here is the value curve. The value is negative. You're investing. You're putting your research, your development and no revenue. I go back to Ziad again for about three, four years. He, all he has been doing is investing. He paid people, he's developed his platform. What sort of revenue? Zero revenue or very minimal revenue. What sort of expenses? High expenses. Profit? No profit. Losses that he had for several years. But he was building what? He was building his platform. At one point in time, he started generating volume. So this is the volume, this is your revenue that is coming. And, he, and he's at this point. He's at this point here in his life where he has invested a lot. He's starting to generate now the revenue. He's at the inflection point where he's going to get a lot of revenue increase in the MENA region and also in the US. And then his cost curve is going to go down. As he develops more, his cost curve is going to go down. His revenue is going to go up. And then the value will start being created in his company. And this, but at one point in time, the volume is going to drop. The cost curve might be low, but the value will drop also. So this applies to everything that you do. It could apply to TVs. So this is the, the real thing about TVs, from black and white to color to plasma to computer monitor. It could apply to, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is the learning curve. So this, this is another important element that you have to apply, is where are you positioned today? So in the case of Ziad, Ziad is positioned here. Ziad is now positioned here where he has some revenue, he has some traction. He is now sitting on a number of orders that will be coming up. These are big orders that are coming up in the US and the MENA region. He has invested a lot. So Sami has been on his back and saying all you have is losses, losses and losses, which is true. He has invested because his cost curve was high. And his, but the strategy that he has here is very different than the strategy that he has here. The strategy that Ziad has here is I need to develop my platform and I need to make sure this platform is best in class behind it. And then, but the strategy that is here is not anymore about the platform. He has the platform. The strategy here is sales. Is hire your salespeople, strong salespeople in the US. Uh, identify the right distributors in the MENA region. So your focus now is not anymore on the platform. He's trying to push me. He said, Constantine, but I need to come up with also product. I said, before you come up with our product, show me that you have traction on your existing platform and show me that you could generate revenue. And then we could invest again in terms of other products. You understand? So this 
curve, which is the life cycle curve, helps you define what is the right strategy that you want to implement depending where Ziad was positioned here, he's now positioned here. In two years down the road, he will be here. His strategy here will be very different. His strategy is Constantin, what, where, where do I need to invest? Because I'm getting close to my maturity point. Is it new countries? Is it uh, new services that I need to, is it new channels that I need to, be, maybe it's not cloud-based anymore, it becomes every, something different. So these will be different sort of strategic priorities that in his mind that what he has today. Any questions on this? I'm going fast, but these are all templates and tools, and you decide which are the ones that make sense for your team, for your organization. Now the other one is the, what we call the experience curve. Basically, the more you learn about doing something, the better you are and the cost goes down. So if you manufacture one car or if you manufacture a million car, the cost of producing your car goes down. And this is not only available for car. So this is, for instance, the case of Honda from 1960 to 1970s. So they, it's 85% slope. This is the, the, the gradient of the slope. Means that basically the cost of Honda goes down uh, every time that they will increase about a thousand unit, two thousand unit, four thousand units. So they will track, they track here the cost depending on how many units they produce. But it's the same thing that applies for life insurance, which is completely different business. There it's not 85, that it's become here a 77% slope. The steeper is the slope, the more there is cost benefits in having large volume. So if you are entering this market here and you have a competitor that is here, the competitor has the way to kill you out because he could reduce his price, he have a number of margin in order for you not to compete. So understanding what is the slope of your curve in the insurance business, in the soap making business, in the health uh, monitoring system helps you understand what your pricing strategy could be depending if you're here or you're here or you're in between the curves. So this is another example is the experience curve. This has also been developed I think by BCG or McKinsey, I'm not sure. And it's a way to be able to try and it varies from one industry to the other industry. Any questions? You're a good team, no questions.